Rigworld Solutions is a wholly owned Ghanaian company that offers multiple engineering solutions for the extractive and petrochemical industries. We manufacture industrial bolts and nuts, fasteners, hoses and fittings. From our factory at Kejibri in Takrade in the western region of Ghana, Rigworld Solutions employs Ghanaians to produce world-class products. With cutting-edge technology, all products are manufactured to ensure the strictest adherence to customer specifications. The threading, cutting, chamfering and stamping of the bars are modeled around the ISO 9001 global standard. Safety is at the heart of every production process at Rigworld Solutions. From the coating to the sun blasting, the washing and the phosphate treatment, our quality control checks are the most rigorous in the industry. We have instituted full part traceability throughout the manufacturing process and all products are measured and inspected for specification conformity before deployment to you. Locate our factory in Kejabri of the Takradi Takwa Road. Call 0302-949917 or 0540-107504. Email enquiries at rigworldsolutions.com. Rigworld Solutions, crafted in Ghana, engineered for the world. The National Democratic Congress NDC was a creation in 92 that ran for eight years in government, subsequently got an opportunity to run again for eight years. You can call it the most successful political party in the Fourth Republic. But is it really still successful? It's lost two crushing defeats in the just-ended general election and the one before it to the opposition party that it has always been wrestling power from or actually fighting with. On Face to Face today, we're going to have a conversation dissecting the NDC through the eyes of someone who has lived it all. My name is Umar Sandamadu. You're welcome to Face to Face. As a young man, I remember him. He was a member of parliament for Nandom. He was called Rawlings' lawyer at a point, he had a close relationship with him. One of the strongest politicians from the northern part of the country, specifically in the Upper West region, Dr. Benjamin Kumboro, is that how it's pronounced? Yes, Kumboro, you got it right. I have yes. tried. What yes. does it mean? Well, Kumboro actually means which death. Okay. Yeah. Which death or which, which death? Which death. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I see. In fact, I don't like to always use, interpret it because it will be taken out of context like all die be die. <laughs> <No>. But, <laughs> but that is that is, what it is though? That is not it. It is more nuanced. It's like Whichever way you leave this world, you you have passed on. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So. You were a member of parliament. You gave up at a point and decided to just go home and rest. You were a minister for defense. Uh, you held other portfolios under the Mills government aside defense. Uh, yes, I started actually as a minister of health. Okay, yes, you did health I under Mills. I interior. Interior. Under Mills. I went to attorney general under Mills. And then under Mama, I became the majority leader and minister in charge of government business in parliament So before I went to defense. So under Mahama, you were just in parliament. You didn't serve. No, you served, I served as you served defense minister. So you had the immediate past defense before mm -hmm. Nitewo. Precisely. I see. Let's talk about you. Um, you were in parliament and then you left. And then you just disappeared. You've been 
out of sight, yeah. almost out of mind. What happened? Was no. that deliberate? Or no, you I'm took not... up an international job? No, no. I actually teach at the University of Ghana Law School. Okay, so you were so, teaching. Yes, I'm doing quite a lot of writing and research work. So, And you know those things take a lot of time. And I think I have about some four manuscripts that are completed. Oh, okay. And I'm getting people to edit them for publication. So you are always busy with education. And for that matter, of course, you cannot be in uh, in um, in the public limelight, we don't see much. Well, I do, I do. The last time we saw you was a June 4 revolution speech. That yes, you... precisely. But I do attend a number of functions. As a former majority leader, I'm a member of the Council of Elders. Okay. And I attend a number of the meetings. We've had a very complex parliament for the first time, this eighth parliament. From where you sat watching, what do you make of the chaos that characterizes the introduction of the new parliament and the fact that we are having a speaker who is not from the governing side for the first time? Yes, if you go back to the parliamentary records when I was majority leader, when I was leaving, the last speech I delivered on the floor was to the effect that if you watch the trends, the electorate was likely to start giving every political party at one time because there was a lot of impatience on the ground about our delivery and our performance. And I said, Western, which will be a good thing that will happen to this country, we are likely in the shortest possible time to have a majority in parliament that is not government. You and actually predicted almost, that? Yes. And I said, when that happens, that is when parliamentary oversight will become very, very useful. That is when Parliament will no more be, continue to be seen as the Cinderella of the three arms of government. Mm, mm, mm. And so you saw we just almost got there. You actually got that. Um, oversight is a key word that you've just introduced. Yes. Despite that, nothing really happened. We haven't seen any desire of the opposition people being met in Parliament, i.e. everything that came became a rubber stamp. It's, it's early days yet. Uh, the parliamentary cycle is a very interesting cycle. When you start, this is the first major recess they've gone on. It is at, after they return that particularly the new entrance in Parliament would have reached approximately the peak of their learning curve and now have a clearer understanding and grasp of the standing orders and procedures in Parliament, you begin to see how it will pick up. And, and I believe that that would be done. The second issue when you have that type of Parliament is that if you watch, that is one of the ways people do not look at things too closely with the parliamentary system. Have you noticed that government has toned down in terms of the daily rhetoric, in terms of the style of delivery, in terms of what you call accommodating some of the in-house suggestions that are coming from the opposition. In fact, in short, government is still yet to recover from the narrowness of the numbers in parliament. And so, it, you find that it is slightly you not know, the situation in which you see boisterous ministers and people throwing their weight around and making all sorts of utterances. People are a bit more circumspect. But, but that has <coughs> the government has had all its ministers go through, its budget has gone through, yes. everything has gone through. Yes, there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. You see, I keep saying that in Ghana, we use terms and practices without understanding their context. All that the Constitution says is that the President will appoint his ministers with the prior approval of Parliament. The word used is prior approval. We turned the approval process into vetting, as if it was what is provided in the American Constitution. And because we use the procedure of vetting, the Constitution didn't use the word vetting for us to develop specific rules of procedure. Second, the qualification of who can be a minister have been spelled out in the Constitution. Same as an MP. 
Precisely. So it means that the prior approval considerations are bound to be based on the eligibility criteria. Any stepping out to use other standards that are not really the standards that you require to become a minister will very much look like you are getting involved in a witch hunt, as it were. So you must, you must be very careful because of that your standing orders have not said if a person has conducted himself in this particular way for the past five years, that is a basis for disqualification. And once they are constitutionally provided eligibility criteria to be a minister, you can't step outside them. But the expectations that people have is that people should use whether somebody fired a gun in a crowd or somebody made some statements against particular ethnic groups. It's difficult to hold them to that. Precisely. And so invariably, the criteria is so circumscribed that most of the nominees will go through. Another school of thought is that if you think the nominees of your opponent are so bad and disastrous, what is your responsibility in giving them good quality material? Let them go through. They mess up. You come Precisely. In. And people say, I say, well, wearing on the nationalist cap that, well, let's also think about the possible consequences for the development of this country because of the level of responsibility okay. that they are going to have. So there are all sorts of scenarios. Okay. Thirdly, you see, we, our national project is still an incomplete one. Mm -hmm. And so our loyalties to Ghana is still very much low as compared to our loyalty to our immediate environment and ethnic cleavages and other networks. So it becomes very, very difficult to see people from a particular area vote against their own, regardless of whether they are in different political parties or not. Because the ultimate is that there are all sorts of pressure groups there, and they will literally tell the MPs that this is your one of your own. He just has to be approved. And you must make sure, with the closeness of the numbers, even three people who decide to rebel will turn everything upside we'll turn down. Everything upside but down. you approve them, and you have always been consistent, talks about the grassroots. The grassroots clearly wanted to see something in parliament, something maybe, maybe just to excite them, even if it's not nationalistic. At least they want to be happy and know that, oh, we are in charge. We even have the speaker. That hasn't happened. The morale of the party base. Yes, and it been... is because of the way people rank the out parliamentary outcomes. As to whether ministers are approved or not approved, I will not use that as a measure of the quality of a parliament. The quality of a parliament is how you address the daily concerns of the real grassroots. I will be interested in parliamentary statements that is depicting pictures of bad roads, showing dilapidated school buildings, showing the socially excluded and vulnerable in society, and calling on government to do that. This is really the value and quality of what you would expect mm. in the parliament of an emerging economy. But a lot of NDC were unhappy. In fact, there is even a call for an overhaul of the leadership. You have been a leader of the House. Yes. What do you make of that call? And I have cautioned against it. Having been a leader in that House, the dynamics in parliament are completely different. There is a parliamentary system and body language that takes place. Until you have been a member of parliament, you always misinterpret it. If you were to attempt to change the parliamentary leadership now, you are going to now build a formidable internal opposition in parliament as a result of that, of not just ordinary backbenchers, but former leaders of the side. And it can be devastating for a political party. But it has happened before. Cletus Avoca left and went to become a minister. Bagbin himself left the leadership of before. You have left Precisely. the leadership before. In fact, we have reorganized in parliament before. 
But let me tell you that most of it was always done through a process of negotiation and dialogue. Okay. And people agreed to step aside. Not an imposition. No, no. So you had ranking members that we thought were underperforming. And because at that time the leadership of the party had had so much experience in these matters, they used various mechanisms until the people themselves said, look, let me shift to this area okay. or let me let this person come in and become. That is how I became the ranking member for finance at a particular stage All right. in parliament. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't negotiate this thing properly, remember that ranking members in leadership of parliament are also seen as representing various tendency and national interests. And the mechanics to put in place the five, the majority leader, his deputy, the chief whip, and deputy chief whip, I think four. Yeah. It depends, there are two deputy yes, chief whips sometimes. Yeah. So it becomes very, very difficult when you are making a change because the permutations is bound to change and people are going to be dissatisfied about it. So if you had your way, the Harun Idris Sumo Barak led minority side should remain as is. Yes. Don't, I, I, don't, don't yes, shake it yes. now. Because actually, we have what we call the extended leadership. Your four front bench are as strong as their ranking members behind them and the back benches. So when you are getting these type of failures, and you look at it only at the level of the front bench, you could be making a mistake. Okay. Yeah. It has a linkage with the immediate extended leadership, and then it has some linkage with the back benches. The complexities of this new parliament is that we also have a speaker from your backyard. For the first time, you're getting a speaker from Upper West Region. And this speaker is not just an ordinary speaker, but a speaker who belongs to the opposition party. What do you reckon Bagbin's speakership would mean to, one, the governance of this country, two, the progress of our democracy? Yes, that is for me a very positive sign. You see, the, we had no incentive to dialogue across parties. We had no incentive for government to relate to parliament in a manner that they are co-equal arms of government. And because the lack of incentive was as a result of always having the government side controlling parliament right from the speaker down to the, 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 the officers of parliament. So with this new change that has come, it's bound to introduce another and a higher level of parliamentary culture and intergovernmental relations. Whether you like it or not, most of it will emerge by itself because if you do not allow that cross fertilization and accommodation of each other you're always run you run into a situation of constant tension and government cannot afford instead of delivering social goods and services to be in a constant conflict with another arm of government that, that can paralyze together that will can paralyze the entire nation. And there are many things that should be bipartisan in nature. The policy in Parliament has been that, one, the economy was too fragile for us to divide on the way government should run the economy. Specific projects and things could be criticized, but that responsibility and trust is given to government deliver and you see most elections the state of the economy becomes a major election issue most of the time so parliaments i have seen it when npp was in power ndc has been accommodating i've seen it when ndc was in power npp has been accommodating on the economy there are also some national issues that do arise from time to time in which a bipartisan approach is normally adopted and so I, I, I am of the view that we will get there. Would this parliament not be too problematic, chaotic at point? Democracy by itself is problematic. So if you have a parliament that is problematic and ensures good governance, why not? 
we do, we, and so be it. You're positive about a bag being speakership for the next four years. You do not see a point where NDC people themselves would say, we thought this guy was on our side, he's not. We're going to yeah. work against him. And then the MPP already had him as an opponent and he's going to suffer. Yeah, the unfortunate situation is that you can remove a speaker so easily. It's a very, very complicated process. And the circumstances under which that can be done are too rigid. The, the, the speaker, to some extent, is insulated to give the office a lot of stability. I see. But when you think of whether he will succeed or he will not succeed, you must look at what went underground before he got elected. Yes. A lot of trade-offs and things were done. And so, you, they we, might we, not we talk didn't, about we didn't it. We see trade-off. We saw an election that he won. Precisely. And I'm saying that before winning, with the closeness of the numbers, a lot would have taken place. Behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. That's what I mean. And that, did that even include selling the integrity of the NDC at a point like some people are suggesting that we would agree to pass some of your nominees? In fact, there's even a claim that Johnson Asedo Ketia was allowed to be a member of the board of the House so that Ken of Rata will pass as a finance minister. Or you think these no, are just no, pure no, rumors no, that should be... I have been a member of the Parliamentary Service Board. And it has always been the practice to bring former members of Parliament onto the Parliamentary Board. But from board. the governing party, not from the opposition Not party. always necessarily from the gov governing party. We have had situations in which we have had non-governing elements who were in the parliamentary service. I see. There have been instances like that. Even the one you bring from the government side, invariably never turn around to be people who just dogmatically support government. Okay. The reason is not so much a political decision. It is very much a representational one to keep a contact with the parliamentary alumni of people who have been in parliament because it also becomes a point of contact between the former parliamentarians and so they articulate a lot of the interest of those who have been to parliament and have left well, this is face to face on city tv my guest is dr benjamin kombo a former member of parliament former minister uh, holding various portfolios my name is umaru sandawan when we come back we asked why he was in Tema with what you can term as a renegade group in the NDC. That's if he would be agreeing. I'll ask him what that group really is and what they meant to do. Stay with us. Available in major supermarkets and shops near you. Excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health. Not recommended for persons under 18 years, lactating mothers, pregnant women, and people sensitive to caffeine. This advert is FDA approved. You welcome back to Face to Face on CCTV. My name is Omar Sandam, but my guest is uh, Dr. Benjamin Kombo. You can call him a leading member of the NDC. This weekend, you had a meeting in Tema. I described you before we went on the break as a renegade group of the NDC. You can call yourself maybe an interested group of the NDC. Did it get to that point where you needed groupings of the NDC to start saving the party from itself, not going through the national executive? Oh, such activities have always taken place in the party. And as we talk now, various groups do meet. You'll be surprised that you have what you call regional caucuses. And they meet to discuss things peculiar to their region in terms of the party. Even within parliament, you've got the regional caucuses. They do meet from time to time. There is former appointees network. We do meet from time to time to deal with the network. So this is not the first time that an interest group or a tendency 
within the NDC has met. But when you see most of the people who were at Tema, and the, the platform that was created has something to do with KDES, the NDC Intellectual Forum, a number of progressives, perhaps as the word I'll use, not renegade, <laughs> people who are progressive minded within the NDC. So this is a normal meeting. Yeah, it's, it's a normal Except platform. Except that you had Guzi Tano on that meeting. It is not usual. Yes, but Guzi has always been a member of what people do not remember. When NDC was being formed, yes. we had some capacity deficits. Because how were we going to build a critical mass? How were we going to make have some technical input to actually guide how the campaign, which was an uncharted path, would have to be conducted. And we set up a research center called the Forum. I was there, Guzi was there, Larajite was there, Mije was there, Chuchu Poku was there. That was the first serious technical electoral office and research office to the extent that every constituency in this country was mapped and tacked to somebody locally resident. And whatever information we wanted, we could get it in a matter of seconds. And the structures we had to build on at that time, that had political clarity with the PDCs and WDCs, that was what provided the critical mass base for a new political party that has never contested and run strategic political elections before. That is where the history of this group comes from. That was the same group that actually issued a statement against what we perceived at that time as brutalities of people during the Kumi Preko. And we signed. If you go back to the graphic, you see the advertisement column in that particular year, indicating that nobody under a constitutional dispensation has a basis to say people should not complain that they are hungry or there's hardship. So we've had this consistent arrangement. As a group. It will, yes, it will interest you that because of the nature of the work we were doing, we said the NDC has never, during the PNDC, had the opportunity to constitute a government under a constitution. So we took a decision that none of us that was providing this technical support should attempt lobbying or angling to get an appointment. And if you remember, Guzi was nominated then as Deputy Minister for Information, and he turned it down. And we continued with that group all the way till 1996, providing these type of services till the party structures. Backroom electoral staff. Camp, precisely. So we monitored, we worked out the campaign strategy, and I can tell you, we were able to demarcate this, all the constituencies in this country into hostile, marginal, and safe. You see, you don't dissipate your energy in worthless causes. So what you will do in a safe constituency and what you do and want in a hostile constituency are different. In some cases, in a hostile constituency, you just want to mitigate your losses and minimize the damage. So the campaign approach there is different. But you see, pro Doc, the problem with this history is that at the time, Guzitano was not a possible replacement for John Dramani Mahama as your torchbearer. Now that you are having a meeting with him, yeah. and he is a possible replacement of John Mahama, the logical conclusion of Mahama loyalists would be that you're rolling around Guzi Tano, possibly pushing him into a flag bearer contest against John yeah, Muhammad. And people like you, very yeah, experienced and yeah. strong party members, and when you're seeing doing that... In fact, but that is what is surprising. In fact, the issue of who becomes flag bearer has never been raised. I've known Guzi, I've known most of the organizers for years. That issue has never been raised. So even what was the Guzi, purpose of the wait, meeting? So even Guzi's interest, mm -hmm. Guzi has never, and Guzi has been very close to me, 
has never, never even indicated any indication that he's the successor to John Mama. Nothing like that. So when I started hearing this, I said, look, let's be careful about profiling people. We need to be very, very careful about profiling people because very soon it might not be Guzi. It can shift to Bagbin. It can shift to Sylvester Mensah. It can shift to Alabi. Even if you have the suspicion that people might be interested, you don't make it an issue when you have not reached there. Doc, for a party <coughs> that is in opposition that is trying to survive into a next election, having meetings with someone who is seen as quote and unquote a faction leader would not be the very appropriate thing to do, would it? No, I do not see people in terms of factions. In fact, I see what I call tendencies. And you must remember, the NDC is a collection of tendencies. We have the right, we have the left, we have the center right, center left, traditional. We have a collection of all sorts of tendencies which we cannot pretend about. That is a source of strength, but it also has the potential to be one of weaknesses. And if you have to communicate and come out with common positions to enrich this umbrella congress, the best way to proceed is from these tendencies. Otherwise, if you were to go to a national congress situation and these tendencies begin to show, I'm not sure you ever arrive at any concrete decision at that place on very fundamental core values of the party. Well, you can always have blocks, but the election decides who yes, the block wins. precisely. But what we are saying is that I will say there are tendencies. Because if you see what differentiates the cadres from other members of the party, it's purely ideological. That one is looking at the revolutionary transformation of the country. But we have all now come under the evolutionary process and not the revolutionary process. And so when you transition into a social democratic arrangement, which is an evolutionary and not a revolutionary process, you have to deal with these things. But one thing that actually surprises me, which we don't know has been the bane of development of this country, this idea of harshing challenges up trying to deal with them in whispers and little corners and not trying to muddy the waters. You can make omelette without breaking eggs. It is the sincerity of your intention and that we are doing these things. We have lived our life. The best thing to do is just pretend that nothing is going on and let the party keep having a series of defeats that because so critical. yes want to be precisely so we have watched the graft and if you see the steepness of the drop you retrogressing all the time precisely and we are asking the question what what exactly is happening because of our length of time with the party if i were to show you the type of messages that i get in relation to the question about what is happening to our party. You keep getting that question all the time. When specific challenges come, people are up in arms. This agitation, that agitation. And we says no. Why don't we care? And I started carrying out a study, just dealing with both the qualitative and quantitative aspect of it to give an interpretation to this fallen graft. Unknown to me, some of my comrades had been involved in similar things. We just happened to have bumped into each other. And we, as we normally do, we started discussing this. And we're particularly shocked that people who have not met for two, three years, we can individually be working and we are arriving at almost the same conclusion. We said, no, why don't we create a platform? Integrate these ideas. In fact, the, ori the idea is that immediately we finished, we were going to put it in a form and hand it over to the party. 
For action. For action. But there is another development that people don't understand. The cadres have started splintering into United Cadres Front, uh, Umbrella Cadres Front, this, but most of it an Accra phenomenon. You don't see that replicated in the regions. Before Jerry John Rawlings died, he had invited a number of us, including Dan Abudegui, that look, put these cadres together. I am not comfortable with these splinter groups, otherwise I'm not going to deal with any of them. We had been working at that for almost a year and a half before he went. So part of the choice to be at this situation was to have the opportunity to also meet some of the faction leaders. And then Bodakwe made it very clear there when he was summing up that what brings everybody together today is the NDC. And the eight cadres can only now be cadres of the NDC. And so this cadre group and this cadre group is not something anybody is interested in. And that's why I tell some friends that let's always credit every person with a fair sense of judgment. I do not see how all of us who have known Guzi all these years, we've worked with him, fine personality, can just go and Guzi says, this is my agenda, and we just flock and follow him. That, that is not possible with the type of relation with, we have. If you love him, you like him, you believe in him, you follow. No. I don't follow things blindly. And that is what people expect. That's my challenge. I analyze everything in its proper context and take a decision. I'm not, I don't believe in head action. And that's why I'm prepared sometimes to stand alone on what I'm convinced about. And not just because I am fully a flock. No. Even when I belong to a group, there's no way every decision of that group, I can agree with it. It's just that when the majority agree and you're going to implement it, you're all bound by it. So at least credit the rest of us, including former ambassadors, former ministers who were at that forum, that they cannot all just be a flop. That Guzzi snaps his finger and they come to follow him into an agenda they don't understand. So it would not be correct to say all of you who were there are Guzzi followers and that you would vote for Guzzi in a presidential election. Why wouldn't I say, why wouldn't you say that Guzzi, Guzzi follows us? Because he wants why do, to... Why, why do you, because if you look at it... Dr. Pumbo has not said he wants to be president. But I've occupied higher offices than Guzzi. Yes, That's why right. the fact that he's a very senior cadre. Why is it that it cannot be Guzzi following my vision, but I following his vision? You see, and I say, embedded in that way of interpreting things and the dominance people attribute to Guzzi is also implicit in that about what I think you, people think of me. Just some simple-minded person who does things because people ask him to do it. Do you have if Jerry were not dead, mm. the narrative would have been different. That all this is being done because Jerry has asked that it should be done. Maybe so, he asked before he left. Jerry would not, that's why I keep saying that. You see, if you have been close to people who have been very close to me, they will tell you that is not the way I do things. Question, do you have a presidential ambition? You see, when people are talking about ambitions, sometimes I, I find them very strange. To say that you don't have presidential ambitions when you are in politics, the sincerity of it is doubted. Because so, people will be saying that, so did you just enter pol pol uh, politics? To end at a level. At a particular level. So the ultimate but, ambition no, of every politician? I, yeah, every politician is to reach the ultimate. Okay. But I don't consciously and I've never mm -hmm. consciously put mechanisms in place and done things to even become a minister. Okay. And I always throw the challenge that there is nobody from Jerry John Rawlings through Professor Mills to John Mama, who can say after elections, I have come to say I want to be offered a job. No. Because I understand government and governance. 
it is such a major challenge. That is if you want to do the work properly. You're not going to have enough time to yourself. And so I don't go to go and do what they call lobbying to become anything. My political life and my development life has never been one of struggling for things. If something would come my way, it would come under all sorts of funny circumstances, it would come. So let me turn the question around. Yeah. You are not deliberately campaigning uh, to be a president, but are people asking you to run for president? Have you considered that option and have you given it a thought and possibly started putting things in place? Uh, these issues about what people think people can become the ultimate has started as far back, I remember 2006, 2005. I still have some messages that were sent to me indicating that, Ben, why are people like you not considering positioning yourself for succession in the future? And my response has been that, look, everything has its time and its place. I don't, I, I can have ambition as a politician, but I don't have inordinate ambition. And particularly when you see that the turf is already occupied and there's no value that you bring onto that turf that the others do not have. When we started loosening up and many more people were throwing in their bit to contest your mama, people have gotten in touch with me and I said, no, one I think John is tried and tested. He had not only ministerial and parliamentary experience, but vice presidential experience. And, and presidential. I think, yeah, vice president. So I think he's our best step forward. But having said that, I will not begrudge anybody in the party who decides to also put in a pitch to be the flag bearer. That is my attitude. So I never attacked anybody. Who contested Mama? Who contested Mama? And I will never do a thing like that. Do you still think he's your best bet, John Mahama, into any general election? Definitely. If you were to look at the odds in opposition, and if you were to see the showing, despite the general, the yeah, you would see that we rebounced very effectively after the crushing defeat in 2016 in 2020. And you attribute and that largely to him, his personality. Because he led us into that campaign. And I keep saying that when we give a leader the flag for things that go wrong, we should also be charitable enough to give him the credit when things go well. And so, yes, when things don't go well and we criticize John Mahama, when things go well, let's credit him with it. And from that standpoint, one sees it clearly. There is another element about doing a one term. You see, when you set a precedent of somebody doing just one term and you crowd him out, it also becomes institutionalized. Anybody with some ambition after one for one term we say you also get out. The reference point is that that's what you did with John Mahama. That's precedence. Precisely. So you need to be careful. So if it was left to Dr. Benjamin Kumbo, you would rather the party repeated the John Mahama ticket until it gets it right. Yes, but why I do not like to make those statements is because of my position in the party. And we know that there are procedures for the party to decide that we have opened the late on political activity and people can indicate their preferences and work for whoever. But remember that a member of the Council of State stands elders. in elders, sorry, stands in a reconciliatory pos uh, position. So you don't make statements that make it difficult for you to be an independent umpire should problems come up and eventually come to the Council of State. Now that you're a member of the Council of Elders, uh, Elders sorry. and the <laughs> national leadership had a meeting with a flag bearer, former flag bearer, yeah. at one quarter, and you had one at another quarter, there are many who think that's a fly in the face of harmony. You are supposed to reconcile the party, and yet you are part of, and you do not want to call it a block, but a group that is perhaps having its own plans that are running concurrent to the, 
yes. party plan. Yes, How are you going to fix yes, this? People just do not understand. This is a functional executive with some national executive members that are going to perform their normal function. Why have people not complained? Why I do not go and attend fake meetings or neg meetings in Accra? Because you are not qualified to attend, do you? Are you I'm not. So why would FEC be meeting? Is it because it's in Ho and it's in a retreat and the nature of issues that I should decide that that is priority for me? No, because the party was not officially aware. You wrote to the chairman, all right. You never no. got a response to invite him we to your We wrote to the chairman, copied the general secretary, and copied the council of elders. I didn't write. And I want you to, you to put this in context. I am not part of the organizers. You were invited as well. As a panelist. And I guess the reason why they invited me as a panelist is my relationship with the cadets, years of experience in the party. There are all sorts of groups who have always invited me. And it's surprising. With all these issues that people are raising, perhaps I was about the only lawyer who publicly delivered a lecture indicating the reservations that I had about the Supreme Court judgment. This is just about two weeks ago. And people have conveniently forgot about that. There are many things I have done in the name of the party. So when people are talking of relevance and irrelevance, it's neither here nor there for me. What does it mean to be relevant or looking for relevance in the party? To be what? I don't belong to that category of crying babies for attention. No. I'm a self-made man. I like to hold myself on my own bootstrings. Have you spoken to John Mahama or John Sinasiru Nketiah or Samuel Fosuampo for since this weekend's meeting that has generated lots of controversial headlines? No, no, I don't think we have because they, they, we are just about three, four days into that controversy. Do you think it's much ado about nothing or there's really a big deal and you would need to go and reconcile with them based on the perceptions fact, that have been I put out I don't even there? think there's a problem, let alone a need for reconciliation. I don't. How often do you... Those who know me mm. will say that perhaps I've even been too diplomatic in the way I've approached this issue. How often do you speak with John Mahama? Well... We have various ways of meeting. He's a member of the Council of Elders. We meet at various levels. But when you see, you see, speaking with your mama has various levels. If your mama has something specific he wants me to do, He'll he gets in you. touch and I do it. If I can't and I think I know somebody more competent to do it, I ask us to refer to the person. And there have been so, several of those okay. interactions. So you're not enemies? But how can, first of all, somebody I've known for years who is very much like a brother just suddenly become an enemy because of NDC, which is a political party that came into being many years after we had known each other? Will we be mature in our way of doing things by letting political perceived differences which are not real divide, you. divide us? How, how long have you and known I him don't before? make enemies. To be, if you watch me, I disagree with people on matters of principle. But hardly would you ever see me bearing a grudge against somebody. This is face to face on City TV. Is it because Jerry Rollins died that the center of the NDC is wobbly? That's the next conversation I'll be having with my guest, Dr. Benjamin Kumbo. Don't go away. Available in major supermarkets and shops near you. Excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health. Not recommended for persons under 18 years, lactating mothers, pregnant women, and people sensitive to caffeine. This advert is FDA approved.
You welcome back to Face to Face. My name is Omar Sanda Amado. This is a show we are bringing it to you from City TV. My guest is Dr. Benjamin Kumbo. Jerry John Rawlings was the soul of the NDC. In fact, he signed the constitution with his blood. I heard someone say that. In fact, senior members of the party say that. He's gone. And now we are seeing this chaos or crisis. Is it because the central pillar around which the party was evolving is no more that you're having all these challenges as a party? NDC is not in a chaos or crisis by whatever standards. You're not. It's because we are not making the comparison. If you were to know what goes on in other, the level of acrimony in other political parties, you would find that we are not in that situation. Where we find ourselves is simply because we've lost elections. And we think that we need a conversation. And it's not just the losing of the elections. It is becoming a pattern. Every political party cannot always win elections all the time. But when you start losing elections in succession, and then you don't seem to see the, the graph rising, it's a source that by itself tells you something is wrong with the party. And so you need to engage in a conversation to find out what exactly the issues are. That being the case doesn't put it in a crisis situation because when you say an institution is in crisis, it simply means that law and order has broken down to such an extent that the institutional structures cannot work. But the NDC institutional structures are working as even evidence by the retreat at home. The Council of Elders are meeting. Tendencies are also having meeting. And you see, when you look at all the, what is in the press statement of what was discussed at who and what took place in terms of, there is no difference. There is a lot of difference. You have talked about perceived corruption internally. You've talked about how to do introspection. Who was talking about about how to hold no, Nanaku They Fadon. talked about reorganization. Yes. Strengthening the branches. Doing a number of things. It's just that it's the words that have been used. But in each of those words, you would find what we are talking about. How can the NDC survive the absence of Jerry John Rollins? That's what I'm saying that. Do you know the status of who, when you see an orphan? Orphans have always grown up to be some of the most excellent and industrious people. It depends on how and what you make of losing a leading figure. If you have the right attitude, it might end up making you stronger. If you have the wrong attitude, then you are going to be filling that void for a very long time to come. But fortunately, Jerry was an individual. NDC is an institution. And so, regardless of how strong a pillar he was, he certainly did acknowledge in his lifetime he was not stronger than the institution that he founded. So when you found an institution, embedded in that process is that sooner or later, that institution will take on a life of its own. Has it really taken a life of its it own? It has. I can tell you what has happened, that the NDC you see today was not the NDC we knew in 1992, 93. So it's gone through transformation. It has weaned itself. And you see, that is exactly the changing nature of the narrative that creates a problem. In one way, they say, nobody owns the party. In another vein, somebody has emerged and he seems now to own the party. So you don't know what the narrative is. I agree with the principle that no individual can own an institution. We are all birds of passage. We will just come and go, and the party will be there. So at any point in time, when you find yourself occupying an office or a position in an institution, don't have it at the back of your mind that it's an entitlement and it's a lifetime job. No. Circumstances is bound to lead to these changes. I am the first student of change. Who knows? That why are you in a hurry to be quarreling with people and disagreeing on things and posturing? Time will make all these angling irrelevant. Simple time 
without your lifting a leg or a hand will make it irrelevant because time hides a lot of consequences and political time is configured differently in politics one week could be like 10 years and 10 years could just be like a week so you need to be like in a, a situation of shifting sand when you are analyzing political events and so i'm not so inexperienced and naive to believe that whatever problems there are today are going to be the same problems that will be there tomorrow if you reduce everything to the minutia it's basically that we think something is not right let's identify it and correct it and arrest the decline but as for people having different styles and perspectives on issues is bound to come in the political party for the graph you have showed at tema yeah. you are showing that the party has been retrogressing since 92 even though you may have won elections in the middle you're, you keep going down. No, no. In, you see, if you watch that graph mm -hmm. and the way the chart has been done, you will notice that the NPP is making inroads. Rising. Yes, in the strongholds of the NDC. Mm -hmm. And then keep it, maintaining a lot of stability in their backyard. In their backyard. While the NDC is sliding down in terms of its strongholds and not making similar inroads into the strongholds of the NPP. Good. And what one thing do you blame for that? That is why our understanding is that there must be a problem at the level of the branches. And I know that after having been in competitive parliamentary elections for some time, Are they I can tell you there were times that in a region like Ashanti, it was very, very difficult to get people to stick out their neck to be part of the elected nine as branch executive, just because of the hostility of the environment. In some particular communities I have visited, you use the telephone number of somebody who is said to be a branch executive, and the person says he's not aware he's a branch executive. And this pattern suggests that there is something happening. To make sure people get elected to the constituency, they literally just sit down and compile the names of 999 loyal people in the branches, who eventually would come and make them constituency executive. The constituency executive will be courted by the regional office holders, and the regional office holders will be courted by people interested in national so you have a conveyor belt down to the branch level and whoever controls the livery is able to decide that please secure these branches and become the executive and help me to become a regional this so, or national. So loyalty to people not to the party. Precisely. That is why you run into the challenges of some of the things we have encountered. Would you I was at a polling station mm -hmm. during the election. But for the intervention, a particular ballot was said to be a spoiled ballot. And when we all looked at it, the electoral staff could not tell you why they would say it was a spoiled ballot. And eventually, the other side agreed and it was accepted. It was your ballot? Yes. I have gone to places and have found out that our agents have actually left the polling station and signed the pink sheets by 12 o'clock while voting was still on the reason why you cannot tell is it money that maybe you at the top are getting money and not giving to them so they well, whichever way we are having problems at the level of the party structures at the local level that translate into getting inefficient polling agent and if you read the supreme court judgment and cases they've cited from Kenya and Nigeria. They made it very clear, the role of an agent, the significant role an agent should play. And so if you play with that level of representation, you only have yourself to blame. So you I can tell you, we have looked for pink sheets from our own polling agents, only for them to be running away from you. They don't have them. Well, the motivation for that 
the inducement for which they suddenly I remember when we had that problem in 2008 I went round just to collect the pink sheets in one particular community immediately the agent got to know I was there they gave us a chair and we sat down and he used the back door with his basket and left <laughs> you know so you see we are not talking of something that just happened yesterday it's not a new thing it's not a new thing and we are now doing the triangulation that look Perhaps this electoral performance, as it is, is occasioned by some of these, and we need to strengthen them and look at them closely. With the opposition you are getting from just a meeting you had, are you sure you can really recover and fix this mess? No, no, it's, it's not as those things don't matter. You will still soldier on? We will go ahead. You will have another meeting? And make our, in fact, possibly a series of meetings and keep making the information available. You are, so, so you're it. not working for the MPP in disguise? No. We will do... Why would I work for the MPP? Why would somebody like me, if I carry 100 Bibles in the streets, who in the MPP will believe me? You see, that's why I keep saying that. There are some people who can easily become another political party. Some of us cannot. Because wherever you even go, your sincerity will be doubted. So why do you waste your energy? What if those and people came age, to you? What if the government people came to you and let said, me, destabilize let, the Mahama NDC further for and us? The, the question we keep asking is that, for what purpose? Monetary and gains, for, maybe? Yes. Appointments? When you look at me, I've been a minister in most of the so-called most lucrative Ministry. ministries. I've never been the subject of adverse findings in terms of my stewardship. It is not that the opportunity was not there to do things. But it has always been my principle that if I want money, I'll go and stake Lotto or I'll practice my profession. And I believe I should be able to leave. With a lawyer of over 30 years standing at the bar, even if I were to sit in my village and make applications for letters of administration at my age, I will still live more comfortably than most people. So I, I want people to get this context very, very clear. I'm doing something very clear in my mind. It is not even something I can stop just because people disagree with me. I'm actually enjoying it, particularly the insults on the platforms. I don't belong to most of them, but good friends. What is interesting is the large number of messages you get from very leading members of the party who, support who say that, look, you have spoken for all of us. That is about time that conversation takes place. So when you get somebody who just makes the statement that these are people struggling to be relevant in the party, these are discredited old members of the party, I can only smile because that is what democratic engagement is about. Yeah. And that's their perception about me. I can change. We wish you all the best and thank you for your time, Doc. You're welcome. That's Dr. Right. Benjamin Kumbo. Uh, that's what he's taught me to pronounce his name as. Former Minister for Defense, former Minister for the Interior, former Member of Parliament, Laura Nandom, Laura Nandom. My name is Umar Rusanda Amadou. This has been Face to Face on City TV. Thank you for watching. Stay with City TV. It's your world.